We're absolutely delighted today to be joined by Deputy Governor Sharon Donnery and Deputy Governor Jarva Rowland, and I'll say a little bit more about those just in a moment. Before we begin this discussion, I also want to let everybody know who doesn't know that we're celebrating a big milestone year at IOB this year. It is our 125th anniversary. We began with 719 members, would you believe, in the year 1898. So we are, in fact, older than the state itself. And we're now a community of almost 33,000 financial services professionals right across Ireland. We'll be marking the anniversary all through this year as we celebrate the 125 years of learning and knowledge, and knowledge sharing also, with a view to helping to raise standards in financial services for customers, clients, and for society. So we're delighted to welcome you to here to this important event today. It comes at a time, you don't need me to tell you, of continuing economic uncertainty, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the resulting humanitarian crisis from that, supply chain issues, the energy crisis, the threat of a recession, have all had highly unpredictable global economic environment. And of course, we have waves coming from uh, San Francisco also. In Ireland, inflation, the housing crisis and cost of living increases are also putting heightened pressure on individuals and businesses across the country. So it is a very volatile landscape. And amongst this, the financial services sector continues to navigate through these transitions to enhance sustainable finance practices and embrace digital technological advancements. To succeed and survive in this challenging operating environment, organisations need, of course, to be resilient and agile. And another key driver of the change that I'm describing within the sector is, of course, the evolving regulatory landscape. The Central Bank of Ireland last month issued a Dear CEO letter outlining key regulation and supervision priorities for 2023. And today we're absolutely delighted to host this session with Sharon Donnery, the Deputy Governor for Financial Regulation, and Derva Rowland, the Deputy Governor for Consumer and Investor Protection, with, both with the Central Bank, of course, to discuss their priorities in more detail. So to do that, let me just join my two Deputy Governors down here. <clears throat> and first of all, to say you're very welcome to IOB, and thank you so much for joining us to do this today. So Sharon, can I kick off with you, please? And to begin with, can you outline what is the current, I, I've briefly yep. highlighted <coughs> the current international influences there, but perhaps you can give us a description of the backdrop to setting the priorities. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for having us, Derval, and I are delighted to be here. really appreciate the opportunity uh, to meet with everybody and talk to you uh, today. Um, and as I said, it's in the context of, um, I suppose, our, our recent letter highlighting the priorities. But the priorities are, I think, very much grounded in, in what you described in, in terms of the economic environment. Um, so I think the way we would uh, describe the big picture is one that is uh, very complex and very uncertain. Um, and you touched on a number of the issues there um, in terms of the sort of global geopolitical issues, uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, the effect that that has had on energy prices, the kind of tail of the pandemic still having repercussions. But I think if you take a step back even further than that, uh, we would look at a sort of economies and financial system that in the last 10 to 15 years has been faced with a whole series of shocks, starting with the global financial crisis, uh, the impact of Brexit, which of course in the end, I think in terms of the risk of a hard Brexit, turned out you know, less severe than we expected, but still um, had certain repercussions, including on the financial services sector here. Uh, we've had the pandemic um, and the war. And also the gaps between these series of shocks have be been becoming um, smaller and smaller. So I suppose a key thing that that brings into focus for us at the bank um, is something that we've been saying a lot over the last number of years, which is about the need for resilience. Um, and we talk about resilience, I think it's important to emphasise that we're really talking about financial resilience. And I mean, I think some of that came very much to the fore over the weekend, and we mm -hmm. might talk about that later in terms of SVB. 
but financial resilience. Um, but also, I think, in the last number of years, putting a lot more focus on operational resilience. And that's partly to do with uh, things post the war, I think, where we see a heightened threat around things like cyber and so on, um, but also some of the wider changes that we see in the financial system around digitalization and the role that technology is playing in the system, and therefore the need to be much more kind of focused, I would say, um, on uh, operational resilience as well. It's also in a backdrop, I suppose, of this very strong response to the inflation uh, through central banks. And I mean, a top priority for central banks, leaving aside for a minute our regulation supervisory priorities, is obviously to get inflation back to target. Um, I think the latest uh, discussions and forecasts around that, including our own forecast at the central bank, which was published last week in our latest quarterly bulletin, is an expectation that uh, inflation has probably peaked. Although that also remains mm -hmm. uncertain, as you mentioned yourself, um, in the context of the continuing possibility, I think, um, of um, inflation shocks. So more locally, I would say our own focus for the domestic economy uh, in terms of growth remains positive, um, although uh, lower, obviously, than the last uh, number of years. And I would highlight those issues that have been subject to some media commentary about the distinction between, say, GDP and what we call modified domestic demand, which is more focused on uh, the domestic um, Irish economy. But as I said, our, our central expectation also that um, inflationary pressures um, are easing, subject to whether there will be um, any further energy shocks. Uh, the last thing I'd say on the kind of wider macro environment, and I won't say very much on it, Mary, because we're on in the quiet period in advance of the Governing Council, so the Governing Council mm. meeting will take place, obviously, uh, this week. Um, there have been clear signals, I think, from many members of the Governing Council about what's expected uh, for this week, um, but I think it reminds us of this sort of strong focus on bringing inflation um, back under control. So it, it just sounds, Sharon, like that the theme of resilience, which you said there, is really a backdrop to all of those different economic events. The theme of resilience is a really strong one. Yeah, so I think the theme yeah. of resilience is really strong. And maybe one other thing I would mention, um, and I think this is true for us at the Central Bank, but also, uh, for example, for the larger banks uh, that are in the audience in terms of the SSM. Andrea Enria has also spoken about this. I would say some concerns maybe about a, a sense of complacency as well in, in some firms, um, and maybe more broadly in some parts of the economy. So uh, kind of idea that, well, we weathered the pandemic relatively well. And I think that is definitely true. Um, and the Irish economy, for example, came out of the pandemic relatively strongly. Um, but during the pandemic, we had very, very strong fiscal supports. We had very accommodative monetary policy and additional monetary policy supports during the pandemic in terms of the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme, for example. We're in a completely different monetary policy environment now. Um, and we also had regulatory supports at that time in terms of some regulatory forbearance, the release of counter-cyclical capital buffers and so on, not just here, but um, globally. So I think the pandemic had these very uh, strong focus in terms of support from the economy in a very coordinated way where fiscal, monetary and regulatory policy were kind of going in the same mm. direction. Um, and of course, it's, it's a real positive that um, economies and societies were able to, to weather that storm as well as they did, given the size and scale of the shock. Um, but I don't think we can sort of assume that because we weathered that storm well, uh, relatively well, that, you know, it's mm. sort of automatic that th things that are on the horizon um, will be the same. So, as I said, I think we're in a very different economic place now, a uh, very different monetary policy environment. And so, as you say, I think this focus on resilience. And you can't always predict the shocks. I mean, who would have predicted what has happened? So I think it's a focus on scenario planning and making sure that sort of whatever the shock is or however things might um, develop um, over the coming years that firms are resilient to the potential for those shocks. So that actually sounds like a, a lovely uh, segue into talking to Derville a little bit more about the whole breadth of the consumer. So just, you know, so that we have people here obviously from right across different parts of the industry, you know, from banking to funds to international banks to corporate banks. Can you tell us a little bit about the full breadth of the consumer protection and investor protection mandate and then maybe build on some of the priorities for this year out of that. So thanks, Mary. Um, and it'll be a challenge to describe mm. all of that um, in the time that we have. But um, a keen focus uh, for us, because we're an integrated regulator, and that is, not, that is quite rare, uh, and, I, and a central bank. So every part of our mandate, we put a consumer and investor lens. Uh, on all of the work that we do. So you see that very strongly when we think about all the work you hear and see from us on the domestic front with the mortgage uh, measures. That is about protecting consumers when they're seeking to take out loans so that can be sustainable 
for them and they can be resilient. It's also about making sure that the lenders are resilient as well and that you can have the economy serving the needs of people in the background and financial services in the background. So they don't have to think about the services, they just mm. use them to help get on with serving their lives. And I'll come on to investor uh, protection in a moment. But if I drill down then, you can see that exactly the changing risk landscape that Sharon has talked about, we were in a low for long uh, environment and that was actually what we all expected. But what we see, building on what Sharon has said, is um, more and more um, once in a, a decade shocks actually happening at a higher frequency and you need firms to have really uh, strong crisis management framework, stress testing, risk management, so that they can pivot and be prepared. Mm. So that theme of resilience comes through into consumer protection and investor protection. And when we do our consumer protection uh, outlook report, and we've published it fairly recently, we see five overriding areas uh, where nearly all of the areas of focus for us will fit into. And we see a changing operational landscape. We can see poor business practices and weak business <coughs> process feeding into risk drivers for consumers. We see a huge technology driver because you all know now your businesses are run on technology similar to our own. And we see shifting business models and business um, uh, preferences of consumers. So within that landscape, we need firms to have really strong and agile uh, consumer protection risk frameworks so they can be alert and agile to the risk landscape. Within the risk landscape, I'll call out a couple of really pivotal things in Ireland, uh, unusual for a regulator to say, but I think uh, the migration exercise in the retail banking sector was a huge challenge. It was a subject of a lot of public concern legitimately. There was like 1.2 mm. million bank accounts between deposit and current accounts that had to move in the system. And a lot of talk about the switching code, but it was never designed uh, for mass scale uh, migration with a lot of complexity in bank accounts with direct debits and card payments set up. And I have to say, I think so far, the job has been done well. That moved from our point of view, from a systemic event to not a systemic event uh, at the close of the year, which I think is a fantastic learning uh, building on before because we had, I think by the end of the year, about 900,000 accounts uh, closed. Uh, and there remains 1.1 uh, million accounts opened, uh, but it's not one for one because there's or ordinary business going on. But I think we saw the phased approach that was taken. We marshaled with industry and others uh, to take a kind of a system-wide approach. And I say that because I think that is the future of effective regulation. And I'll come to yeah. that in a moment when I talk about what good would look like in the individual accountability framework. But we looked at individual lenders' positions, we looked at the position of the system, and most importantly, uh, all the relevant players in the system got together and uh, make, made it work at a system-wide level. Now, of course, uh, we have to be vigilant this year, and we will, and it may be that some of the more complicated and complex bank accounts with complex needs are left, but I think it's good to see that we can marshal at the right time with the right phasing of the approach, with the right resourcing, with the collective effort to um, bring our uh, work, um, all of us, to play our part. And now I'm going to look at another key issue, which is the availability of credit and debt. And this is a really serious issue for consumers and firms in serving the needs of their consumers, particularly as we know, based on uh, what Sharon has said and what you know in running your businesses, Inflation has got to be tamed, but that also means people are facing a cost of living challenge. We, you all know from your energy bills, your food bills, your wages are not going up, and people uh, with mortgages, it's often the biggest debt that they have, will be under pressure. Interest rates are going up. So a keen focus for us is that firms, and we took quite an extraordinary step, Mary, to write to firms mm -hmm. with a Dear CEO letter, being really clear about our early engagement expectations and early risk indicators. Because we know from our past experience, unfortunately, the key determinant in better outcomes is early engagement. And the code of conduct and mortgage arrears is the key framework designed to support customers who are, and most importantly, who may be in arrears. And we expect banks and non-bank lenders to have uh, an early 
thoughtful strategy about their expectation, about the, the trajectory of their own interest rates, their customers, who will be on variable rates, who will roll off, and how that will work out into the future so they have early risk indicators. We do not want to see customers concerned or not supported. So the key message is for businesses to tell their own customers mm -hmm. that early engagement is wanted, is beneficial, is necessary, and have the operational capacity in place and the skills in place to support customers. We know that that is the key difference in the past, early engagement and meaningful application of all of the different uh, options and treatments. So there are a couple of the key areas for us and we will be looking especially at uh, customers in the non-bank sector who maybe have no choice, where they're not writing new business uh, and particularly looking for areas of vulnerability. And we have engaged directly with the businesses and with other stakeholders and we will continue to do that with MABS, the Insolvency Service and others because it's very important we exercise vigilance and another key element in this will be switching, that we will expect switching to work as intended so that customers who want to exercise other options uh, can do so. So that's another key area of focus. I'll mention briefly then uh, the Consumer Protection Code. Mm -hmm. You'll know that we're in a discussion phase uh, that will close very soon and you can expect a consultation on that whole framework later this year. The landscape is changing so much, as Sharon mentioned, with innovation, digitization, gamification, customer preferences changing. Of course, people are still concerned about bricks and mortar and being able to access cash, but we also need to move uh, in a modern way uh, to facilitate all the different types of engagements customers have. And I want to come to investor protection. We're still concerned about asset valuations. Uh, we're concerned about shocks in the market. So we will be uh, continuing our focus on resilience, uh, that firm stress test, uh, that liquidity management is well done, so that if there are redemptions or margin calls that firms in a position to meet that, that they keep a keen eye on leverage. Uh, these are important aspects. And of course, the sustainability agenda is a fantastic opportunity uh, for firms to have products that meet the needs uh, and desires of their customers and also meet a huge goal uh, to the benefit of all of us, but it needs to be done well. Um, individual accountability, Mary came out this week in a mm -hmm. consultation, and uh, that is an opportunity for industry to use that in the way that I think we demonstrate a degree of maturity in the banking migration work to internalize that and deliver in their own businesses high standards of governance with good outcomes for their customers. And that's what we see this as a governance tool and we'll welcome feedback on that. Sharon, can I turn back to you a little bit just to set out, you gave us the economic context of it. Within that context, you talked about resilience as a priority. Are there other priorities? And I know your area, while it's in the Prudential, it's also massively influenced by the stability agenda too. So are there other priorities that you'd like to highlight for us within that? Well, I think maybe first, <coughs> just kind of teasing out the economics a little bit and touching on, on what Derville said, because there's been a lot of commentary about the high interest rate, uh, the higher interest rates in terms of the effect that they're going to have on things like, you know, banking sector profitability, for example. Um, I think the events in uh, the US at the weekend, I think, highlight some of the other aspects of this changing interest rate environment in terms of the risk for firms. Uh, and these issues around, for example, um, you know, liquidity mismatch or asset liability mismatch in terms of interest rates and staying uh, very focused on that. But, you know, Derville mentioned the um, consumer or the borrower lens in terms of people getting into difficulty. Mm. Um, and, of course, I think, uh, you know, a heightened vigilance, early warning indicators around uh, the potential for distress in loan books. We see a lot of commentary about uh, commercial real estate, for example, particularly post the pandemic. And um, I mean, the landscape, I think, here in Ireland has changed very much uh, since the global financial crisis in terms of the exposure of our firms uh, to commercial real estate. Uh, there are some exposures in the fund sector as well. But again, I think really thinking through some of the kind of changing economic context and, and what that means uh, for the different aspects of uh, banks' businesses. And maybe the other area to highlight, I know you want to talk about a little bit about innovation yeah. uh, later, uh, Mary, and there are many different aspects to that. Uh, but of course, I think one of the challenges for existing firms around um, innovation is this 
kind of very rapidly changing landscape, uh, the potential for disruption uh, to business. And of course, they, the central bank were not here to sort of protect incumbents mm. or protect existing business models. And we really want, I think, to see the benefits of innovation really harnessed in the economy so that consumers and the economy benefit from that. Uh, but I think firms really have to think about sort of their business model, the sustainability of that business model in an environment of a very uh, kind of rapidly changing um, industry from the point of view also um, of uh, digitalization. As Derville mentioned, I mean, there's a number of policy issues um, like the Consumer Protection Code and the Individual Accountability Framework. I'd also highlight on the domestic uh, policy front, uh, we have the Retail Banking Review, yeah. um, which uh, I mean, many people may have been involved in the consultation process and so on that the department had. So there's a big agenda uh, that we'll be working with the department on uh, following up on the Retail Banking Review, including on things like um, access to cash and potential for more regulation around uh, ATMs and CIT providers. And we also have a very busy um, European agenda on the policy uh, front, I would say. So uh, I think as I normally describe, the kind of alphabet soup of things that are coming at us from a European perspective. So I think for most people here, uh, the Digital Operational Resilience Act, which again is about uh, what yeah. we've been talking about in terms of resilience, uh, but much broader um, in terms of operational resilience and also much broader than the financial industry, also about sort of third party providers and, and some of the big uh, providers you would use from the point of view of say cloud and IT. Um, so there's a big agenda around that. Um, and of course we haven't even spoken about crypto yet and we have uh, Mika, uh, the mar uh, markets in crypto assets uh, legislation or, or directive coming through um, as well. So there'll be a, a busy agenda around um, implementing some of those big sort of European pieces as well. Brilliant and I really do want to offer people uh, the opportunity to come in with questions so if you have questions get ready now we're going to, I'm going to come back to the audience in one second. Just before I do though Sharon to drill a little bit more into you know you spoke there about the innovation yeah. piece but also related to that is the authorizations yeah. piece and what firms can expect either you know brand new firms seeking authorization or indeed an authorization for a new type of business etc what can they expect from the bank uh, when they go with a new authorization proposal yeah, so first of all, I'd say for us, um, the authorization process is extremely important. Okay, so I think if you think about the sort of life cycle of what we do from the time firms come to talk to us about maybe setting up all the way through, I'm sorry to even mention it, but to the potential that, you know, you're going to have to be resolved at the end or, or firms are going to want to exit the market themselves. And again, uh, the US events at the weekend are a reminder that firms uh, can and do fail. And of course, we don't operate a no failures regime here either, uh, nor do they in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, so I think the authorization process is a very important kind of entry process for us to get to know a firm, get to know its business model and get to know uh, what uh, it wants to do. The authorization landscape has really changed fundamentally here in the last four or five years. So I mentioned Brexit earlier on and the effects that it has had on the financial system. And we really saw a massive change around that time in terms of the types of firms that wanted to come here, complexity, new business models and so on that we hadn't seen before, um, but also the volume of firms. And I think it also represented a sort of step change in terms of the level of, of, of firms coming here. So even though the kind of initial Brexit flurry has abated, there is still a very large pipeline of firms with us that are either exploring uh, coming into the market mm. or are going through the process. I would say we did hear, I think, um, Derval and I over the last sort of 12 or 18 months, feedback, concerns about the authorization process. Uh, and we have made a number of improvements, I think, in terms of trying to be clearer about our mm. expectations. What can you expect as part of the authorization process? How long it will take, um, uh, you know, and how you deal with us, how you engage with us um, and so on. I think though firms also have to be reasonable, the authorization process depend, in terms of how long it takes depends on the nature, scale and complexity of what you want to do. Mm. And it also very much depends on the level of firm preparedness. So I think from our point of view, uh, what we often see is firms that, to be honest, are poorly prepared. Uh, firms that maybe, um, particularly those that are coming from the tech sector into financial services, um, are not necessarily ready for moving into a regulated environment. Uh, we also, I think, partly to do with the European framework and the changes that are happening there, we see firms that want to avail maybe of different parts of the European framework. So they want to be a payment firm and they want a MIFID application or they want mm. an investment and something else. So a lot of kind of complexity in what firms are, are looking to do. 
and mentioning the European framework again, many firms are coming here to operate in Europe. So we are also, in terms of the gatekeeping part, uh, we're looking at firms that are not just entering the market here, but also operating in a European context to make sure that the standards that we uh, you know, implement and, and use here um, are also protecting uh, the European uh, sort of framework, the European market, um, and our own consumers, but uh, European consumers um, and investors um, as well. So as I said, I think a complex landscape, a lot of firms still wanting to come, um, fintechs in particular engaging with us through our innovation yeah. hub and we published our annual report on the innovation hub um, last week and I, th I think there's been very positive feedback about that as a way to sort of have a kind of pre or early engagement uh, with us. In terms of feedback I think we've really tried to address some uh, process improvements um, and some better communication so firms can um, understand what to expect. But a lot of the onus is also on firms to be well prepared. And I think if you're well prepared, you'll generally find the authorization process pretty smooth. Um, and maybe last point then, back to this issue of, you know, the kind of entry point. Authorization is just the beginning. <coughs> okay, it's not the end. So I think many people mm. think, oh God, have to get through the authorization process. But the authorization process is just the gateway to a relationship that's going to last with us in terms of regulation and supervision for the entire uh, life of that firm. Now, depending on what you're doing, I mean, supervision is very much about a risk basis. So, you know, we have a finite amount of resources and they're focused on the biggest mm. risks. And um, so the firm, you know, you may be getting a, an individual team of supervisors. If you're a big bank or big insurance company, you may be getting a team that has a portfolio of firms. If you're some other types of firms, smaller firms are getting a more sort of reactive supervision that's very data led. But it is nonetheless uh, uh, the start of a regulatory and supervisory relationship, not the end. And I think firms have to get into that mindset too. Brilliant. Thanks, Sharon. And I know people definitely want to hear about the code and the accountability regime and a million other things. Just on the accountability regime, you mentioned that, Daryl, that you know, yes. you've just published the uh, consultation paper. What can people expect now? Uh, and what are the, the, con the issues that people should be focusing on in relation to that? How can they be continuing to pre-prepare while the consultation is going on? Okay. So I know from, uh, we've been expecting this for a number of years. So I think it's been really well signaled in terms of the um, key constructs of um, the proposal. And it has finalized, I think, as expected. So that's a good thing. It means that firms have had plenty of time to ingest the concept uh, and uh, think about how they want to make it work so that their firm uh, runs better in the long run. So we know that we're taking a targeted approach. Mary, we can expect the in-scope firms, about 150, first of all, uh, for the full uh, approach to be applied. But um, the consultation, it's just out this week. We're going to do a very uh, big event, I think, with the Law Society, mm. uh, with a lot of people invited so that you can get into the detail uh, of the consultation at a practical level as well as uh, any policy level, approach level, so that you have as much engagement as you want on this. So that's important to say, and I think we're going to fix the date um, pretty soon. Uh, within the next few weeks, uh, you, the event will happen, uh, and so we'd like all of you to come to engage. So that's really important, so you can get comfortable. Uh, you can expect for us to want this to be something that strengthens firms themselves. That we see this as a fantastic way to be clear about your governance, about roles and responsibilities, and standards to be expected of senior leaders uh, and senior people in business. I don't think there's any magic in the conduct standards myself. They very much reflect an ethos and an approach that we thought uh, was already in place, but I just think they're explicit. I think that's beneficial for people working in businesses. I think it's beneficial for businesses. <coughs> you will uh, expect us to take what we want you to have as confidence in a measured and purposive approach from us. We would like to see, like my vision for the financial services sector, our vision, is a mature sector that um, serves their customers well. If things go wrong, they fix it quickly and definitively uh, and move on to get on with the business of providing good quality products and services to their customers. That's good for business and it's good for their customers. 
Uh, so accountable in the truest sense being internalized by business and not an immature relationship where the regulator has to list out the homework, chase with a long list of RMPs, chase back as to why they're not done, chase back again um, and then have systemic reputational issues exploding into uh, the financial services landscape where we're all on cleanup duty later. That's not where we want to be. I think I see green shoots with uh, some of the engagements that we've had already where we know we have individual and collective responsibility as um, the financial services system working together and as firms or regulators operating in them. We each have a different role, but we have to work that together. So the approach you will see is there will actually be two consultations, Mary. The first one will focus on uh, the um, standards and the way that SEER will be implemented. Mm. You can expect by the end of the year, the conduct standards, including the accountability of senior individuals for running their parts of the business to come into force by the 31st of January. Now that's a proposal in the consultation, mm. and of course it's subject to hearing feedback from you. And you will also expect to see the fitness and probity certification and inclusion of holding companies. Again, the proposal to be that that comes in by the end of the year. For me, that's really important. The fitness and probity certification is a maturity signal for us that businesses are taking accountability for uh, the standard that the people who work in their own business uh, adhere to. So it's not the regulator chasing, it's the firm saying, we're confident about our own people. Mm -hmm. And that's what a mature system uh, should do. And then we are suggesting in terms of the regulations with the prescribing responsibilities of different roles and requirements, uh, the uh, allocations, if you like, we take a little bit more time that that might come into force on uh, the 1st of July. But that's a proposal in the consultation. For us, the key enablers, the real force in this are the elements of the standards, really. The map is a very useful tool and should give clarity Honestly, from experience, some of you will have worked in, in very large organizations. Uh, in fact, transglobal organizations uh, at very large scale. It is easy to get lost in organizations like that in terms of role and responsibility. I certainly know I've had experience trying to figure out uh, what is going on uh, at different issues and it's very hard sometimes. Mm. That's a surprise to people when they hear about that, but it's not a surprise if you work in those large scale organizations. So we think that map is going to be hugely beneficial, but the key driver are the standards. And we think that's something that shouldn't be a surprise or something to be scared of. Good businesses would want to operate to high standards and we see it uh, in that way. So we would like to be confident uh, ourselves and industry that this is a, a tool that will help drive good outcomes owned by firms. Mm. Firms internalizing it, being accountable and we will be listening uh, to your feedback because we want this to be a success. Yeah and certainly as an educator within the industry you know we obviously support those standards through our programs and we'll continue to do that as, as SEER evolves and make sure that we adapt towards that also. Uh, can I do another quick check just to see if anybody has thought of a question at this stage? There's one right there. So because of the bank failure uh, in the States, obviously, the last week, uh, Moody's has now downgraded the, U the U.S. banking system to a negative uh, outlook. Um, do you think that that will eventually have some ripple uh, effect on the European banking system? Oh, well, so the first thing I would say is that the banking in itself that failed, and it's very much, a kind, I think, an emerging kind of story. OK, so we're still learning a lot about what went on and, and what sort of underlay the exact failure. Um, the first thing to say, I think, is the bank itself doesn't appear to have had uh, very many direct connections with the EU financial system. So obviously there was this uh, entity in the UK and there was a, a branch in, in Germany as well. Um, and some interconnections certainly with uh, firms like our own fintechs here, but not really uh, large interconnections with the European uh, banking system. Um, there are some very specific aspects uh, to the failure, I think. And also, um, as you'll have read in the media, a lot of the public debate has been focused on 
uh, the differences in the regulatory regime in the US in terms of the requirements around liquidity and, and so on. And also, I think, some of the gaps, certainly, that the media is reporting on at the firm in itself. Um, I think the main issue for now is trying to understand exactly what happened uh, there and trying to make sure that there is no kind of contagion effects. But maybe the one thing to come back to what we were talking about earlier, and I don't mean this in, in any way to be alarmist, but more that a part of the issues in this bank were certainly about the changed interest rate environment. Um, and I think probably what will turn out to have been very poor management of uh, interest rate mismatches on some of the liquidity issues. So I do think, uh, I'm not suggesting there are issues like that here, but I think it's an important reminder um, of the fundamentals of kind of making sure the basics are done very well and also that firms, not just banks, but firms more generally understand the really changed uh, context and environment uh, that we're now operating in. Brilliant, thanks. That Gerald, did you want to say something? Uh, I just... Yeah. Uh, it's a wider point about resilience, about hedging, about um, you can get caught out um, when things change. So you have got to have very clear approaches uh, to your resilience and your ability to think about how you need to be set with your stress testing mm. and thinking about that changing landscape because some of it uh, is the basics. It also makes me think about some of the airline companies that were caught out with the... Um, fuel changes and mm. there were basics like hedging uh, that caught them out and it's just not possible to operate at scale uh, without thinking through how you need to organize your business uh, and you know fundamentally have a review of your risk assessments uh, when that environment changes and that's a parallel that funds um, and uh, lots of different sectors uh, should be thinking yeah about. so it, it's something that applies much more yep. broadly mm. uh, is there another question here yeah, here we go. Um, I'm Daria D'Agostino from ANL Goodly, so one of the few people in the room not regulated by the, the central bank. But just a, a, just a quick question on the, the, um, on the implementation dates and the approach in the, in the guidance for the IAF. We've done a lot of work already with firms preparing. It's been very well signaled. So a lot of firms have already done what they can to put in place a framework subject to the consultation and, and the final expectations. You mentioned, Derville, there's a, a phased timing with the standards coming into force at the end of the year and the requirement to prescribe responsibilities, maps and things like that in the summer. And it just seems to us, having worked with a lot of firms, that as you said, the additional standards include a requirement on executives to effectively take steps to ensure the part of the business they're responsible for is controlled effectively, etc. That's in at the end of the year. But then firms are only required to sign off on their responsibilities in the summer. So I don't know if there's a reason for the gap, but it seemed to us that really, if they're the dates, you really have to have your whole plan in place by the end of the year so that your responsibilities are allocated to the executives who by Christmas have to abide by whatever their responsibilities are. But I don't know if there's a reason for the gap, but that's our reading is really get it done by Christmas. Um, we're open to listening in the dialogue in the mm. consultation. That's the first thing I want to say. And we have a, a big event uh, to have a discussion around uh, the implications and it is not uh, two separate pieces. We understand that from a firm's point of view. They want to organise their people who are clear about what's expected of them and they want to organise their business so they're clear about the roles and the responsibilities. But the way the framework is set up is that regulations have got to be put in place with the prescribed uh, responsibilities on different roles, etc. So it's it's just designed differently, and uh, we're open to listening to the dialogue uh, from firms. And if firms are ready in advance of that, of course we're going to listen to that. But it may be that they have some of the work done, and then they want a little more time for the detail. And it will have to be put into place through a different mechanism. In the, uh, the that's the way the law is designed. So we are very clear that there's no reason why not in terms of the conduct standards and uh, those additional standards, but because you have to have regulations um, for the rest of it uh, so that firms have a perfect line of sight on what to expect, we thought it may be a reasonable proposal to give more time. But if I'm hearing from you, there's no need, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, I, of course, I think your colleagues here will have a word with you afterwards. 
but we would be ready to move sooner. There's no problem uh, from our side. We just thought to open a, a reasonable dialogue, uh, but that's a first for me. But we can move sooner <laughs> if, if that's uh, wanted. That, that's a, a lovely note, I think, for, for us to, to finish up on. Uh, I mean, the agenda is clearly enormous. There's so much going on. Uh, what I'm really struck by, though, is the very common agenda. I mean, everyone in this room, regardless of where you're sitting in this room, wants to work financial services to a way that is in the best interest of society. That's where we're all heading towards. And I think, you know, some of that elaboration around it is going to be really helpful um, for everybody to say, how can I implement these? What can I do? Uh, honestly, we could have had another hour or yeah. two. So I really do want to thank Sharon and Derval for giving their time so generously to us this morning and for making those very detailed points so succinct for us also. Uh, and thank you all for coming to join us for this today. Appreciate that. Thank you.